of phenomenon. So I contacted the Minister of Defence back in, I think it was October 2016. At that time it was Jerry Brownlee. And he denied any knowledge of NZDF involvement in aerosol operations in New Zealand. So I said, well, if there's no involvement, perhaps you wouldn't mind if a group of researchers visited selected RNZAF facilities just to actually do an independent inspection and audit of military aircraft records. But, you know, his answer to that was, no, you can't. So it's one of those situations where they tell you there's nothing to hide, but then they're not willing to open the books and let anyone check. This is Bruce Lipton, and you're listening to Green Planet FM. Kia ora, greetings, and welcome to Green Planet FM 104.6. I'm Tim Lynch, and I trust that you are doing well. I invite you to stay with me over the next hour as we discuss and find ways to take care of our unique and magnificent Green Planet Earth. Within the bubble of our biosphere that is encapsulated by an invisible membrane that is our atmosphere that protects us from the extreme cold of space, live you and I and over 7.6 billion human souls among mega numbers of living creatures all sharing the invisible breath in this profound experiment we call life. Yet at a surface level, humanity is facing the greatest challenge yet, and that is the journey from our head to our heart. Though we have many differences, we also have far more attributes that we hold in common. We all love our children, we all love nature's splendor, and we at heart all want a better life of joy and connection. However, we also are at such a critical juncture that we have to find ways to resolve all our conflicts, both inner and outer, especially among our emerging global family, whilst at the same time face and solve our ecological, economic and social challenges that are here to empower us to evolve ourselves to a higher level of being so that we can create our way into a new paradigm. And all it may require is a change of heart that will finally unfold unity consciousness. This time is now. On the phone from Christchurch, I have Malcolm Scott. Malcolm is an experienced and qualified researcher recognized by the Tertiary Education Commission here in New Zealand and has authored several research reports for various organizations and is currently working on a thesis about people's perceptions and experience of climate change and chemtrails. In 2015, Malcolm began investigating correspondence with various New Zealand government agencies and the Ministry of the Environment about the public reporting of alleged high-altitude chemical aerosol spraying operations from aircraft in New Zealand. These are commonly referred to by the public as chemtrails, and since the late 1990s, chemtrails have become a global phenomenon. So, kia ora, Malcolm. A big thank you for wanting to disclose what you know about this vexing subject of contrails, chemtrails, and geoengineering. Kia ora, Tim. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for having me on your show. Yes, I've been working towards this for some time. And the skies over New Zealand are changing dramatically. So many people now are noticing these long white trails across the sky and are photographing them. They are also happening overseas and they are happening here in New Zealand, yes or no? Well, the answer is categorically yes. That's pretty clear to anyone who's grown up or lived in New Zealand prior to the early 2000s. They will know that what we used to see in the skies over New Zealand prior to the early 2000s is very different to what we see today. Yes, thank you. So can you tell listeners how you became involved in this realm and that is after receiving some sort of compromise, strange information from government agencies? Well, I guess what the, the backstory for me was, I first learned about the chemtrail phenomenon probably early 
2011 and uh, I learned about that like a lot of people through social media and my wife was actually the first person to sort of see this and she told me about what she was seeing online and at first I thought oh you know this can't be real I mean how could they possibly be spraying chemicals into the atmosphere on such a, a large scale without everybody knowing about that so that's how I first really became interested in this and I remember in 2011 that was the year of the earthquakes here in Christchurch and I was uh, I was in the center of the city one morning and I looked up and I saw this this long white trail going from right across the city right across the horizon and I'd never seen anything like that before and it persisted for well probably an hour or more and I thought, oh, maybe that's what people are talking about. So that was my first encounter with this, and I started researching from there on. In 2015, I started corresponding with the Ministry for the Environment, really just to find out what they could tell me. And, well, what they could tell me was, well, they didn't tell me very much, to be honest, but what I did find out is that the Ministry for the Environment has been contacted by numerous members of the public since about 2010. They've been sent photographs, videos, they've been sent information by the public which is alleged evidence of chemical aerosol spraying. But the Ministry for the Environment has, to my knowledge, failed to investigate a single one of these reports. And you followed this up with a video in 2017 that really clearly clarified this, didn't you? Yeah, that was back in June 2017. That was actually the International March for Geoengineering, International March Against Geoengineering. It was a, uh, a worldwide protest being organised in the USA, but there were events taking place around the world various cities around the world and in New Zealand there was uh, Dem- Auckland, Ragland, Taranaki and in Christchurch we had the seminar that I presented to a, a gathering of maybe 30 people in Christchurch. Well people are becoming aware so where are you today and then we could maybe then go back and then tell the story, what is geoengineering, mm. and then we'll have a difference between vapour trails, contrails, etc. Just a quick summary. Yeah, well, I began my research in 2015 in preparation for a thesis, which I'm now currently partway through. So I began corresponding with the Ministry for the Environment, as I said. I've also corresponded with NIWA, the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research. I've corresponded with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Authority, the CAA, the Civil Aviation Authority, and also the New Zealand Defence Force. And all of these organisations, one way or another, deny any knowledge or involvement with geoengineering in New Zealand. And yet all of these organisations have received correspondence from the public. And some of them have received quite detailed evidence, as I said before, numerous photographic evidence, some video evidence, Some have even received analysis of rainwater concentrations, principally demonstrating concentrations of aluminium, barium, strontium, and even lithium, which are commonly associated elements reported in chemtrail aerosol geoengineering chemicals. There's a lot of research coming out of the United States that substantiates this, particularly by geophysicist J. Marvin Herndon, who's published probably five or six peer-reviewed articles on the subject. So my correspondence with the New Zealand regulatory authorities has really just been to establish what they know. And they know a lot, but even though they've received all of this information from the public, they are still denying the existence of the chemical aerosol spray in New Zealand. Yeah, profound. Well, look, for a lot of New Zealanders who have seen these trails across the sky, could you say or tell them what you know in relationship to what is geoengineering compared to, say, a vapour trail and a contrail and then a chemtrail? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, again, uh, you know, for New Zealanders who have lived here prior to the early 2000s, you've only got to think back and remember what you used to see. And prior to the early 2000s in New Zealand, a typical contrail that you would see in the sky would be 
a short trail, maybe extending up to a kilometre behind the aircraft, and it would move across the sky as the aircraft did, and it would evaporate usually within seconds. So that, that's what would be a, a typical aircraft contrail. What people have been observing since the early 2000s and most significantly since about 2010 when the aerosol spraying operation is alleged to have ramped up in New Zealand um, are these long persisting trails that extend sometimes from one horizon to the other for hundreds of kilometres. They persist for extended periods, sometimes even for hours, and they often have a tendency of spreading into what can become a kind of a, a hazy cloud cover, which people commonly refer to as chem cloud. So these are aircraft trails that are not simply the, the emissions from, from jet fuel. There's obviously other chemical components that are actually persisting in the atmosphere. And of course, this connects directly to the science of atmospheric geoengineering. And you only have to look online to find out that in the last two or three decades, there's been a, a massive increase in research into the science of geoengineering, particularly the notion of solar radiation management, which is the idea of spraying chemicals into the atmosphere to increase atmospheric albedo and effectively reflect solar radiation back into space. So this is a, a huge technology that's been growing mainly out of the United States for the last two to three decades and apparently has been applied in countries around the world. Well, just quickly, I'll throw my few cents in. I flew as flight crew for Air New Zealand internationally. I spent quite a bit of time flying over the United States as well, even in a private capacity, and from 1976 to 1993, I was up on the flight deck often, and I always looked out the window because I'm very keen to see just what's out there from the standpoint of this magnificent curvature of the planet, and now and again you may be able to see it, but mostly it's all clouds. So with regard to chemtrails or contrails, I never saw anything like this at all in all my life. And I'd see these aeroplanes, particularly from the flight deck, and they'd be passing underneath our aircraft and they'd be passing above our aircraft. Yeah. And we, I'd see them all the time and nothing came out of their exhaust that is like what we see today. So I'm just wanting to put that stake in the ground to let everybody know up until the late 90s, this was not what you call a common scene. Well, that's correct, Tim. And, you know, the other thing connected to that is that aircraft that were manufactured in the early 1990s, many of them are still flying. So, in fact, the aircraft that you were flying in back then, which were not emitting extended aerosol trails, well, many of those planes are still in the air. And yet, you know, now we find that many aircraft are emitting these trails. So either there's been a radical change to the jet fuel that's been used or it's a combination of deliberate aerosol spraying operations or a combination of both. Yes, well, the information that I've been able to glean and gather shows that there are a number of ways that they have been, shall we say, dispensing what they're doing up there at altitude. So there is something going on. Can you explain and push that out a bit more? Well, a lot of the research that I've looked at has come out of the United States, and geoengineeringwatch.com is it's a pretty good source for a lot of information. If you look at the research by Alana Freeland, who's written two books on the subject, she traces the global aerosol spraying operation back to the early 1990s through a CIA operation known as Project Cloverleaf, and there's a lot of information about Project Cloverleaf available online. So you can kind of see where this began as a military coordinated operation in the 1990s, but it appears that since the late 1990s and of course in New Zealand into the, the 2000s, it appears to have escalated into a global operation which clearly has involvement and complicity by uh, civil aviation operators. Very much so, yes. Well, 
I mean, I've just come back from Austria and Germany, and I saw them and I photographed them there as well, and I was in the Caucasus along the Black Sea in 2015, and I saw one long trail going over there along the coast of the Black Sea. And then in 2014, I was in the southwest of the United States, and I saw them myself, and I photographed a whole lot. But unfortunately, three computers and my backup were stolen in a burglary in my house under very mysterious circumstances, and so I lost a lot of my stuff. Sure. But this is, as you say, it's going on globally, and a lot of these so-called chemtrails aircraft turn around and then they go back and they do a lattice work virtually across the sky. Could you explain a little bit more there or do you want to focus really on what's happening in New Zealand? Well, what I will say is if your listeners want to understand more about the science of the aerosol spraying operation, they should just look up an article by J. Marvin Herndon published in 2015 and he's based in San Diego and he's done an analysis of aerosol fallout in California and his kind of observation was he would see aircraft flying and this is apparently quite a common occurrence in the United States uh, aircraft flying a, a grid pattern and these are military aircraft that that are specifically modified and designed for aerosol spraying operations so they fly a grid pattern and their mission is effectively to grid the sky with uh, aerosols, which effectively spreads out and creates a, a kind of a dirty chem cloud haze. Um, and if you go online, there's a lot of that kind of material posted by residents in the United States. Fortunately, in New Zealand, we don't have that kind of scale of operation, but the scale of operation in New Zealand is, you know, at a point where, you know, members of the public are posting photographs of chemtrails up to social media almost on a daily basis. So it is fairly prevalent in New Zealand, but not to the extent of what you might see overseas. I agree. I mean, it was just interesting. I was looking at Northland chemtrails last night, and they had a picture on, on the 11th of January showing a long chemtrail. And so I went back into my camera, and sure enough, here I was... 150 kilometres south of Whangarei and I'd photographed one too, or that one going up. So people are connecting the dots, so to speak, that it's prevalent right across our country. Can you tell us where most of it is happening? And I know that I have actually seen pictures of aircraft down at Ohakia Air Base. I think they had Evergreen International there many, many years ago, and they say that is a one of the alphabet agencies airplanes yeah for sure well a lot of the a lot of the photographs that are posted to social media uh you know just ordinary folks who are out and about observing these uh, aerosol trails across the sky taking a photo or taking several photos and posting them online and in new zealand it appears that many of the aerosol trails that are photographed are actually from commercial aircraft because people are able to use aircraft tracking platforms to identify aircraft and many of them appear to be commercial aircraft although there are I have seen some reports of people who have photographed aircraft that are not visible on the online tracking services and these are probably likely to be military aircraft that are operating without transponders in which case they're not identifiable and of course the military have their own kind of rules of aerial operations they don't have to comply to the same regulations as civil operators so military operators tend to use unmarked aircraft so they're converted aircraft but they don't have military insignia and they tend to be unidentified and there have been reports on social media of these kind of aircraft in New Zealand yes well in your presentation that you did in 2017 you talked about a whole lot of us at 757s and over 100 had been modified and they don't have, as you say, any insignia on. They're virtually just grey or off-white aircraft. Yeah, according to William Thomas, 
Will Thomas, who published his book in 2004, Chemtrails Confirmed, the US Air Force began converting Boeing aircraft back in about 2002. Um, so that was really the start of the build-up of the global aerosols grain fleet. The US Air Force just simply didn't have enough military aircraft of its own, so they started buying up old Boeings and converting them. And I think Evergreen Airlines, you mentioned, has been connected to that. And there are other commercial operators in the United States that specialise in weather modification technology. So there is a growing fleet of chemical spraying aircraft around the world, and some of these may actually be operated here in New Zealand, either on loan or possibly leased to the New Zealand Defence Force, but that's unknown because the Defence Force denies any knowledge or involvement in aerosol operations. Yes. It's interesting because I think you did say that you approached the military and says, well, look, as the military are part of the New Zealand government and you're a taxpayer and we're all taxpayers, are you able to, as a qualified researcher, are you allowed to go in and have a look at some of these military aircraft? And there was a definite no. Can you explain a little? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I contacted the Minister of Defence back in, I think it was October 2016. At that time it was Jerry Brownlee. And he denied any knowledge of NZDF involvement in aerosol operations in New Zealand. So I said, well, if there's no involvement, you know, perhaps you wouldn't mind if a group of researchers visited selected RNZAF facilities just to actually do an independent inspection and audit of military aircraft records but you know his answer to that was no you can't so it's one of those situations where they tell you there's nothing to hide but then they're not willing to open the books and let anyone check yeah I know and uh, it's like there's another side to it too we're concerned about or people are concerned about nighttime operations you mentioned mm. that there's um a big AC-10, which is a XDC-10, that can carry 145 tonnes of fluid, of liquid, in one delivery, mm. has been seen at Ohakia. Can you explain a little? Oh, well, that was actually... There was a video of an Omega Air tanker at Ohakia back in 2010, and you're right, it's a KC-10 tanker. Um, again, it's one of these converted you know, civil aircraft used for tanker operations, and Amiga Air operates out of the United States. So there have been other reports of tanker aircraft visiting NZDF um, facilities in New Zealand. So I guess the question is, why would the New Zealand Defence Force be needing such uh, large tanker aircraft to be visiting them, and, and whether or not, of course, there's a connection here with delivery or supply chains for aerosol spraying operations in New Zealand. Again, the New Zealand Defence Force won't disclose that information and it's very hard to verify without access to uh, New Zealand Defence Force facilities and records. Yeah, so are you getting any support from the academics or the professional world? Well, there's a lot of people researching geoengineering around the world most of the research that's been undertaken in academia is connected to theoretical or modelling based approaches to geoengineering technology and there is a growing body of research into geoengineering governance which is around how geoengineering should be regulated by public authorities. So, you know, that was one of my key questions to the Ministry for the Environment. And when I wrote to them in 2015, I asked them, what steps has the New Zealand government taken towards developing a regulatory framework for geoengineering in New Zealand? And their answer was nothing. They have done nothing about that. So even though around the world we have geoengineering technologies and geoengineering research taking place in many countries of the world, New Zealand hasn't taken any steps to develop a regulatory framework. Now, that was back in 2015. Uh, I wrote to the Ministry again this year, 2018, just asking, well, it's been another three years, what steps have you taken? And the answer is nothing. 
So, you know, in New Zealand, the Ministry for the Environment is showing no interest whatsoever to act as a responsible regulatory authority. They have done nothing about regulating geoengineering in New Zealand now or for the future. Very concerning. Now, one of the things that you have had is just getting to the truths, and there's a lot of denial going on, and you've caught the establishment, for want of a better word, you've caught them out on a number of times by not really having any ethical considerations, and mm. it's a case of Nicky Hager and John Stevenson and the hit and run, the military in New Zealand totally denied of any wrongdoing in Afghanistan, but they were found out to be telling porkies. So what we're finding is that can we believe the military and can we believe the Ministry for the Environment or the CAA, the Civil Aviation Authority? Because in that video you showed the frustration that you experienced through not being able to get any truth from these people or any commitment to actually look into this deeper. I'm getting, you know, the consistent response from all the regulatory government authorities in New Zealand is that they have no evidence that, you know, geoengineering or aerosol geoengineering exists in New Zealand. And yet, you know, that's contrary to thousands of New Zealanders know and witness on a daily basis. For example, there's a petition being circulated by a change.org at the moment that has more than four and a half thousand signatures from New Zealanders who recognise that aerosol spraying operations have been underway in New Zealand for some time. So the public are not foolish. The public can tell the difference between a contrail and a chemtrail. You would think atmospheric scientists, civil aviation regulators and even Ministry for the Environment specialists should be able to tell the difference. Well, I don't think they're that stupid either. I think they're following a directive that they won't disclose what's taking place in New Zealand. Where's this directive coming from? Where do you think it's coming from? Well, it must be coming from the highest level of government. Yes, well, it's interesting. I have met David Parker some years ago, and I put a, a question to him about the increasing debt of New Zealand, particularly straight after, or around about 2012, I think. And I looked at him and asked him about it, and I thought that he was actually a good human being. And he told me, he said, I don't know what we're going to do with our debt. And he looked at me and he said, it is a huge problem. But now, because he's gone into government, he has to now tow the party line and like Jerry Brownlee, who had to put a signature on a denial letter or statement, David Parker has also had to put a signature on a statement that basically puts him in a very unenviable situation. Well, that's his problem. I mean, it's his word against the public of New Zealand, and I got a, a letter from David Parker a few months ago stating categorically that New Zealand is not involved in any atmospheric geoengineering operations, but there are thousands of New Zealanders who would disagree with that. Yes, yeah, well, you dig yourself into a hole, don't you? Now, well, just further to that, Tim, you know, it's not, just, it's not just a matter of denial, it's also a matter of disinformation. So, for example, back in February 2013, the Civil Aviation Authority emailed a member of the public who made an inquiry about this and they said to this person that chemtrails are an urban myth. Now I contacted the CAA and I asked them to provide me with the information on which they base that claim. So you know where do they get this idea of chemtrails being an urban myth? Well the answer is they have no documents or material that verifies or substantiates that claim. So, in other words, the CAA just made that up. And that's not the only time that happens. I contacted the EPA and I asked them, what is the basis of your claims that aerosol geoengineering is, is not taking place in New Zealand? 
the EPA was quite insistent that the existence of high altitude aerosol spraying from aircraft has been repeatedly dismissed by the scientific community in New Zealand. So I asked them, well, please send me the information from the scientific community in New Zealand that you've referred to. They don't have it. In other words, they just made that up as well. So it's not just a matter of government authorities denying the existence of aerosol spraying. They're actively misinforming the public about it. Yes, and New Zealanders really have to have a hard think about this. Now, I've got one friend who's an environmentalist. I'm an environmentalist or ecologist, Mm. and I am outside as much as I can, but I'm finding that the environmentalists and the ecologists don't want to look at this at all in many cases when they say, oh, look, there's just an increase of the percentage of humidity or water in the atmosphere. That's why these so-called contrails are longer. Can you dispel that in a few words for me, please? Well, there's no doubt that the, the atmosphere, the planetary atmospheric systems are changing uh, for lots of different reasons. But that you know, that explanation for extended and persisting trails, that's a very weak explanation, actually, because these trails are being observed in New Zealand and around the world throughout the year through all seasons. So that means through all seasons, different temperatures, different humidities, different climatic periods and during different, um, you know, prevailing weather systems. So... You know, you can't just give one explanation to dismiss the entire phenomenon because these aerosol trails have been observed under all conditions. So I think you'd need to go back to someone who's saying that. And again, that's kind of the response you get from people who actually haven't done any research themselves. Thank you. Yes, yes. Can I ask about this barium, aluminium and strontium? That yes, of course. It's their spikes globally and they're finding it in ponds and they're finding it in rainwater barrels mm. and people who are collecting water off the roof. Mm. What is the suggestion? If people are actually getting rainwater from the roof, they need mm. to find an independent person or laboratory. Are there some good independent laboratories in New Zealand or have they all been contacted by certain operatives to, I don't know, quieten this all down? No, no, that's not the case at all. The independent laboratories are actually doing their job very well. I was in contact with someone from Hill Laboratories, which is a a New Zealand laboratory, and they have, I was told that in the last seven or eight years, they've done nearly a hundred, or at least up to a hundred, rainwater tests for members of the public, specifically looking at aluminium, barium, and strontium. And many members of the public, well, you know, there's been quite a few cases where the rainwater analysis has demonstrated this. I'm thinking of one from 2013, which was taken in South Canterbury. This test was done, there were two tests done 10 days apart, and the second test, in the second test, the, the chemical element concentrations had tripled in a space of 10 days. You'd have to say, well, what happened in the space of those 10 days for those two rainfall events for the chemical concentrations to triple? Well, there's lots of ways you could explain that, but certainly one explanation would be that there was aerosol spraying taking place during those 10 days. I am speaking with Malcolm Scott, a tertiary researcher here in Canterbury on geoengineering aerosols and chemtrails and do a search called aerosols over Aetearoa Malcolm Scott his excellent video yes I was in America in 2014 and I managed to go and have lunch with one of the clean air agencies in one of those states and I had lunch with one of the managers and I asked him about barium, aluminium, and strontium. Oh, yeah. And I said, aren't you finding yourself getting compromised by the fact that this is happening? And they said, no, not really. And the reason is, is that they are not expected 
to test for barium, aluminium and strontium. It has been censored out of the criteria in which they have to test. Okay. And so if that's the case, you can see that we've been blindsided by some organisation further up making sure that the public don't hear about this. And uh, that sort of blew me out. But I realised how horrible this whole situation has come about. And we want to be able to find ways for getting people on board. Now, you did mention that social media here in New Zealand has been chasing it. And I've gone up once or twice and had a look, and I saw Vinnie Eastwood make a number of statements up there. Can you mention a little bit about social media here? And if you're allowed to mention either names of the Facebook group, that'll be fine. Mm, Yeah, well, there's several Facebook groups that I'm aware of. Uh, There's Geoengineering Watch NZ. There's also Chemtrails New Zealand. And I think both of those groups have more than a 1,000 members. And I think there are other weather modification Facebook groups in New Zealand and also around the world. In fact, the the chemtrail phenomenon has precipitated a global awakening by people on social media who are posting information about aerosol spraying operations around the world. Now, one of the things is, you know, often for many of the, the people that are posting to social media, they'll often encounter other people disclaiming the chemtrail phenomenon, saying that it's a hoax, making things up about it. And again, this is part of the the disinformation campaign. And often you'll find that people who are attempting to debunk the chemtrail phenomenon are either people that have done no research themselves or they're people who are actively involved in trying to dis- disinform the public and a good example of that would be the kind of information you find on websites like metabunk mick west mick west yes yeah i i'm really concerned about that human yeah well you know this guy seems to be very active in trying to misinform people about this and he drags up old videos from world war ii bombers and all sorts of weird information disclaiming the existence of chemtrails. And, of course, the whole point of this, Tim, is to create confusion in the public mind. So for somebody just beginning to be aware of this, they go online and they see some information about chemtrails and then they see other information disclaiming this. And, of course, the mainstream media is active in really a a complete disinformation campaign because mainstream media will take information from websites like Metabunk and they'll publish that and there's numerous examples of newspaper and online media articles disclaiming the existence of chemtrails so it does the whole point is to create confusion in the public mind it is I become really aware of this it's there's an old saying you muddy the waters well what they're doing is they're hazing out the sky well they are that's correct Tim. and I think it's important for people to recognise and realise that one chemtrail across the sky and then another one afterwards, as they sort of unfold and then they sort of spread out, and I've watched them and I photographed them on a time sequence as they span out and you can nearly get a, a hazy cloud forming and then all of a sudden the day goes from a blue day to a ever more slightly, slightly hazier day. Well, Tim, that's exactly what geoengineering technology is for. The whole notion of solar radiation management is to increase the albedo effect of the atmosphere by spraying chemicals into the atmosphere that effectively create a cloud layer notionally to reflect solar radiation, notionally to reduce this so-called phenomena of global warming but of course there's many problems with the geoengineering operation in that firstly it's largely untested except for what's happening right now and also there's no way of knowing whether these aerosols in the atmosphere are actually going to reduce global heating or actually increase global heating because these aerosols also have a thermal effect so whilst they may in some respect reduce incoming solar radiation they may also trap 
thermal radiation within the atmosphere and actually exacerbate global warming. So basically, you know, this was put very well by Tim Lenton of um, the University of Exeter when he called, yes. this, uh, he called this an uncontrolled experiment. So effectively, the planetary system and humanity are being experimented on at a global level by the geoengineers and the military geoengineering operators. And this has been done without our official informed knowledge or consent. It's been done to prove something to somebody. And there are many vested interests in the geoengineering operation. The military operators see it as a way of weaponizing the atmosphere. And if you look at Alana Freeland's research into this, you'll, you'll find there's a, a whole array of atmospheric weapon systems technologies that have been developed alongside aerosol spray. The commercial operators, of course, there's money in it for them. And then the, the geoengineers get to do the science. So there's a lot of vested interest in continuing this operation without public consultation. So it's a huge, huge problem. And look, I wanted to cover a number of things here. There's the video called Overcast by the Swiss filmmaker Matthias Haig. And he has shown that they wanted to see if they could get high enough up in an aircraft to capture some of these chemtrails and then take it back for analysis. And one of the biggest difficulties, of course, is to be able to find an aircraft that can actually get to the levels that some of these jet aircraft are flying. And I'd like to think that somebody with their own Learjet or Cessna mm -hmm. jet would say, look, yeah. I t I, guys, I'll tell you what, I see what's going on. We'll see what we can do and do a deal with the activists to go right up there, photograph it real close, mm. and and yet that hasn't happened in all the years that America has been having this problem. And so it's yeah. a very tightly locked down airspace, really, isn't it? Well, yeah, and of course, since 9-11, <laughs> everything's become tightly and locked down. So you're quite right about that. I mean, there's plenty of videos that people have taken from civil aircraft where they've looked out the window and seen sometimes just a matter of a few kilometres away another aircraft laying an aerosol trail. So there's lots of video documentary, but to actually get an aerosol sample at altitude, yeah, you'd need a jet aircraft and you'd need a lot of money. Yes, well, we're all... <laughs> volunteers are cash-strapped at the moment in so many ways, Malcolm. I want to now follow just a few. There's this guy called David Keith. You would have heard of him. I think anybody who's done any research into the chemtrail phenomenon would have heard of David Keith. Yes, well, I call him a head tripper, and, <laughs> yeah. and he's got this infamous saying, we are free riding on our grandkids by we are an experiment in motion. We don't know the outcome because within the biosphere, everything is tightly coupled and, and working exquisitely homeostatically in so many ways. And when you get down to the, the bacteria and the fungi on the ground, which are the many ways the engine of the world of life, we are finding that by putting all, all these chemicals across the face of all the land surface, it's going to have the knock-on effect. We're going to see birds and insects, and well, there's no, there's so few insects now splattering on your windscreen of your car compared to 20 years ago. So there's a huge effect that we have not yet taken into account because we are the experiment, we are the guinea pigs that are at the bottom of this ladder. Uh, it's very worrying to me, Tim. I mean, the aerosol spraying operations that we're witnessing today, you know, the real environmental impact on public health and on animals and plants is really going to, you know, happen partly in our lifetime, but more increasingly in our children's and grandchildren's lifetime. And there's, a, there's an issue here of intergenerational justice. I mean, the operations that are taking place by this generation are actually going to impact on the next and subsequent generations. And, you know, I'm very worried about the future of the environment, given the, the high level of toxicity. I mean, in New Zealand, our government has acknowledged the terrible state of our waterways. And, you know, there's steps underway to try and clean up our waterways. 
and that's fantastic, but the problem is if these aerosol grain operations continue, then it won't just be our waterways that are toxic, it, it'll be everything, because these aerosols eventually reach ground level. They come down in the rain, they come down by effectively by the force of gravity, and there's been quite a bit of documentary evidence found in North America, because North America's been heavily sprayed now for more than two decades, of plant Dieback? Damage to d plant dieback, exactly. And of course, there's also speculation around these incredible wildfires that are taking place in the Northern Hemisphere that part of the ferocity of those wildfires is that the um, aluminium oxide that is landing in the forest is effectively acting as a fire accelerant. So, you know, we're just basically scorching the earth. That's right. And I have heard that they've been using chemtrails to block off the the winds coming off the Pacific Ocean and so the west coast of America from sort of south of Alaska right down to northern California all or into California, the rains haven't come and geoengineeringwatch.org really gets into that and, and so we need to allow people and listeners here to do their own research as well Malcolm so that they can really get a handle on what this horrible thing is because I wanted to be able to mention I went up and I saw a geoengineering article an interview with an US Air Force general Richard H Rolig oh, yep. uh, by Dane Wigington and he mentions how this Air Force general and another one General Charles Jones both they're retired so they can break ranks a little more but they are concerned because one of them lives in Tucson, Arizona, and he's just looking up in the desert skies and and seeing all these chemtrails, and he now is prepared to come out. And so what I'm finding is that there may be some good people out there who really have a heart, who are honest and are super courageous and wanting to be able to say, hey, look, I don't want my kids to have this. I don't want the magic and the magnificence of this planet degraded by a secret operation that's essentially chemically poisoning the world as we know it. And we just need to be able to inspire the masses, inspire people to make this connection to getting involved. Well, I think, Tim, the, the whole chemtrail phenomenon is an opportunity for everyone to awaken to just how chemically drenched our environment is. And it's not just aerosol spraying from aircraft. It, all of the, uh, I mean, we've been, you know, agricultural sprays have been used since the 1950s. We drench our food conventionally in chemical sprays. You can walk down the supermarket aisle, down the solvents aisle in any supermarket, and there are hundreds of different products for sale, all different kinds of chemicals for the household and the garden. And effectively, we are part of a generation that has grown up in the chemical age. And really, what's happening in the atmosphere is just an extreme example of the madness of the chemical age, where there is a chemical for almost everything, and every chemical has an environmental consequence. And humanity just has to start recognising that we cannot do this any longer. Yes, the chemicalization of life. I'm coming across many, many mums and their children are suffering from allergies. And, oh, yeah. And if we, if we can mobilise mothers, and mothers are the ones that are the nurturers, they're the ones who are really with their kiddies right from <laughs> the moment they're born, and they want the best future for their children. So I've run into a number of women just very recently and I've talked to them about do they believe in these chemtrails? And it's amazing. I'm, I was shocked that how many women do actually know that what's going on out in the environment is definitely questionable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there are thousands of New Zealanders who are aware of this, and you've only got to go onto various social media sites and to see that there are... Well, actually, there was a, a recent research published in 2017 that indicates that in the United States, about 30% of the U.S. population are aware of the chemtrail phenomenon. That's over 100 million people. So people are waking up to this. 
around the world and in New Zealand. And, you know, the call here is to hold our government accountable, to demand public disclosure, and also for each of us to begin to think about our relationship with the environment. I've said this before, you can walk down the solvent aisle in the supermarket and for about $6 you can buy a can of insect killer. So, you know, you can become an aerosol operator yourself and many people in New Zealand and around the world spray chemicals around their homes to kill bugs. Well, humanity is being sprayed as well. It's really just an extension of our consciousness. Very true. And we've got to get into the universities. Uh, late last night, I found a piece that I'd written back on the 15th of February 2014 where Massey University was actually having a discussion paper with a number of professors there on looking at geoengineering from a New Zealand standpoint. So it's embedded in the system. Yes, I read that article. It was actually um, by a group of researchers using market research techniques to identify public awareness of geoengineering. And what they found was that the public has a very low level of awareness about geoengineering. And because it's such a technical subject, it's actually a very hard one to understand without doing some research. What they did find is that among people that were aware of geoengineering, there were two specific branches that they looked at. They looked at carbon dioxide removal technologies and they looked at solar radiation management technologies, which is effectively aerosol spraying. And they found that the people that they interviewed had a preference for carbon dioxide removal, meaning they're more interested in planting forests and creating carbon sinks than spraying chemicals into the atmosphere, which would be a far better solution. So true, yes. Malcolm, so what would you suggest we do? Because, I mean, I'm a great believer in how a community can come together. Mm. And I also know that we have to commit and we have to be able to find ways to get all generations involved in this one because this is a huge problem because, and I'll just say one small thing, there is a U.S. Air Force paper called Owning the Weather by 2025. It's up on the web, and it states that by owning the weather, it is a force multiplier. Now, this is a head trip if ever there was one, because a person who is grounded living among a community that's cohesive, and you can hear children playing, and you can hear bird sound, and you can smell fragrance of flowers. When you're at this level, you're part of the living environment and you feel good and you're meeting your neighbours and you're, you belong, you're connected. And this is what we want to build on. Have you any ideas? Well, firstly, the Pentagon document you mentioned, weather as a force multiplier, owning the weather in 2025, is a key strategic objective of the United States military because the entire global atmosphere and planetary systems are being weaponized as ultimate military weapon systems. And I know that a lot of people will find that staggering and difficult to believe, but there is a lot of information available about this now. And Alana Freeland has done a lot of research into this area. And I think really for us members of the public, you know, what we need to be able to do is keep exerting pressure on our government to disclose what they know. I suggest that people keep writing to the Ministry for the Environment, send them emails, send them photographs, do the same with the Civil Aviation Authority and the Environmental Protection Authority. Even though you may not get a reply or the reply you get may be incorrect, the point is every time you write to one of these authorities, this correspondence becomes part of the public record and the public record is what will determine whether it's through a parliamentary process or whether it's through a court process it's the public record that will substantiate what is taking place in New Zealand and that is the only way to exert leverage on the government to come clean and to actually tell us what they know and to tell us why they're doing this and to actually begin to consult with us about this. This is excellent. Thank you, Malcolm. Greatly appreciated your courage. And 
wanting to lay it all out. And so I wish to say thank you again and look forward to the feedback from New Zealanders and maybe in a year or two time we can talk about this game. Hey, thank you very much, Tim. And if your listeners want to watch the video presentation that I did in 2017, they just need to Google aerosols over Aotearoa and they'll find a link to that. And that's got a lot of the material that we've talked about today. Yeah, lovely, yeah. Okay, Malcolm, you know, the other day we spoke and I made a statement, I didn't want to be an activist and yeah, I, just, I, yeah. I just wanted to be have a lifetime on a healthy planet with family and thriving community yeah. and you've found yourself in the front lines yourself. I know, I know. There's, you know, I really, at a personal level, Tim, you know, it breaks my heart to see what's happening around us. Uh, I have days where I feel very upset about this. Um, yes. And for me, the, the one thing I can do is do the research I'm doing to get the information out the way we are today. To me, it's kind of a moral obligation to do what I can. Yes. Well, thank you. If I'm ever in Christchurch, I'll give you a yell. That would be great. I'd love to meet up if you have come to the South Island. That would be good. Okay. Well, cheers, brother. Hey, fantastic, Tim. And appreciate all the work you're putting into this because you're, you're a pretty dedicated guy to not just to this issue but to a lot of environmental issues. So I appreciate your work. Thank you. Yes. Yep, well, we've found this is my lifetime calling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds like it's mine too. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Okay, bye for now. Cheers. Bye. That was Malcolm Scott, the tertiary researcher from Christchurch talking on the challenges of aerosols, chemtrails, geoengineering. And I hope you didn't mind that I put in a little bit of natter after the interview just so that you can sense the authenticity and goodwill of what and who is Malcolm. If you want a good starting place from a website here in New Zealand, Northland New Zealand Chemtrails Watch. Northland New Zealand Chemtrails Watch. It's run by Claire Swinney and she has got a science degree, a master's science degree with honours. So Claire is a very alert and astute person. Then there's geoengineeringwatch.org in the US. It's so huge, it's nearly overwhelming. There's a very important graphic showing the aircraft flight tracker radar images that were captured on July the 20th and July the 21st, 2018, just days before the start of a catastrophic car fire on July the 23rd very telling. These captures reveal the extremely anomalous flight paths of two separate aircraft over the Northern California Reading area. Decide to network. Use every letter you write, every conversation you have, every meeting you attend, every email you send, and remember even Facebook. To tweet and to express your fundamental beliefs and dreams. Affirm to others the vision of the world you want. Network through thought. Network through action. Network through love. Network through the spirit. You are the center of a network. You are the center of the world. You are a free, immensely powerful source of life and goodness. Affirm it. Spread it. Radiate it. Think day and night about it, and you will see a miracle happen. The greatness of your own life in a world of big powers, media, and monopolies. But of 7.6 billion individuals, networking is the new freedom, the new democracy, a new transparency, and a new form of wholeness and happiness. This originated by Dr. Robert Muller, Chancellor of the World Peace University, in Costa Rica, Central America. I invite you to be able to come to greenplanetfm.com where we have over 400 interviews in our database which you can readily download and listen to to be able to inspire yourself to become the change you want to see in the world and become involved in caring for your children and grandchildren's future. We are also on Facebook, on Green Planet FM and ourplanet.org. 
Please come and love us. This is Tim Lynch. And or Lisa Eyre. And Liz Gunn. In the spirit of Aroha, wishing you a wonderful week. We look forward to being with you next week. I say kia kaha and hairi rā.